It's hard to believe that we're coming up to the Yom of Pesach and it doesn't seem we'll be able to be together as a shul. It's interesting, I was I was thinking to myself over the last few days, what will I miss the most from Pesach about not being able to be together as a shul? There are two strong experiences uh, that are, are a very special part of Pesach for me that come to mind. One is, it's such a special thing to look out at the shul first night of Pesach and see so many visitors, so many children of our members, so many grandchildren of our members, so many parents of our members, grandparents of our members. It, it's such a it's such a special thing to see. It's Baruch Hashem, the, the broader extended young Israel Shomrim with a family, to be able to wish all these guests a good Yom Tiv, to see the happiness on people's faces that they're together as a family. So unfortunately, so, so, so many families appropriately will not be together this Pesach. But it, it it's such a nice thing for me to be able to look out and see these beautiful families together in our shul. The other thing that I'm really going to miss is, it's not even my minog personally to say Hallow Seder night in shul. But I love the Hallow Seder night so much. It's so many people in the room singing the beautiful Pesukim of Hallow together. Uh, for me, these two things are uh, very special parts of Pesach. And what makes them special is all of us together as a community. And uh, I'm very sorry we won't have that experience this year. Well, it seems not. If we reflect for a moment about the difficulty of being separated from each other, um, we do need to also reflect about gratitude to people who have helped us stay connected. Uh, two weeks ago, I gave a video talk and I thanked a list of people. I, I still thank them all, but for the sake of brevity, I, I, I just want to mention a few more names. Um, this week, uh, Rebbe Silver put together uh, two beautiful presentations uh, relating to people's mental health and, and, and emotional well-being. Uh, there'll be another one on, on Cholamoid. Uh, also this week, uh, Serena Kalish and her committee uh, put together a great panel on COVID-19. We're so grateful to them. We're so grateful to all of the wonderful panelists from both sets of presentations. Uh, very, very special that we could have that on such short notice. I also want to give a very special thank you to the hospitality committee and specifically Todd Friedman. Todd worked very hard to whatever extent possible in these very strange circumstances to try to find, uh, to try to match up appropriately hosts and guests. And then things sort of changed in the middle and then things changed even more. And uh, as he always does, Todd approached all of it with such kindness, and compassion, and the sense of responsibility. And, uh, we we're really very, very grateful to him and the entire committee. Uh, we're honored, honored to be represented by you. If I could just branch out beyond the shul for a moment. As a community, we owe a great deal of gratitude to the Mikvah Muna Society. Uh, the effort put in over these past weeks to see to it that the Mikvah continues to be a safe place uh, a healthy place for women to be, to be able to perform this essential mitzvah of what it is to be the Jewish people um, is tremendous. We're so grateful. We're so grateful to Rebbitz and Shin, the manager of the mikvah, to Lori Tol to, to Lori Tolchin, to Nomi Baum, to each and every one of the attendants. Uh, thank you very much. And I also want to mention the Chabra Kedisha. Um, the the Dvor and Dean Grace and the heads of the women and men's Chavar Kedishas uh, have put in tremendous efforts to make sure that every person who comes for a Tahara is protected and we're extremely grateful and they and every member of the Chavar Kedisha are, have extended themselves so much to make sure that even in times such as this heaven forbid a person passes away they're taken care of as is spiritually and religiously appropriate with the greatest of respect. I just want to go through 
for a few moments some of the halachic issues that are a bit different this year because of the coronavirus. I'll try to do it in chronological order. First of all, just in case anyone doesn't realize, um, I'm I'm doing Mechiris Chametz this year in terms of signing up for Mechiris Chametz. I'm doing Mechiris Chametz by online form. Uh, if you haven't been able to access the online form, if it's difficult for you, please feel free to contact me directly. Uh, the actual sale I will do, and uh, God willing, will be done in person with uh, with a non Jewish purchaser. But uh, the, the the individuals from the community signing up, we're doing it by online form. Um, the siyumim this year um, will be available by Zoom. God willing, we'll have three different siyumim. Um, people should have food ready, so immediately after the siyum is done, you should partake of food instead of going downstairs to the social hall. So uh, God willing, we'll have the Zoom information out. Uh, it's already out, but we'll, we'll remind you of the Zoom information. Um, in terms of garbage, uh, if people have chametz garbage after the chametz pickup, there is going to be a dumpster in front of the shul this year. I'm not talking about the shul's regular dumpster. I'm talking about a special dumpster uh, for Pesach. If people find it difficult to get out to the dumpster or, or aren't comfortable coming out to the dumpster, um, I, God willing, it should be a small amount of garbage anyway. I'm a garbage pickups Monday. Um, I would just recommend pouring some bleach into your chametz stick garbage, the, thereby rendering it uh, inappropriate for a dog to eat. Um, either way, I'd strongly encourage you to uh, keep any chametz that you're throwing out separate from the rest of your garbage as of garbage pickup on Monday. In terms of the, the disposal of chametz, there will not be a communal chametz burning this year. Uh, those not comfortable privately burning the chametz I would recommend uh, breaking the chametz up into small pieces and flushing it down the toilet. This would just be the chametz from the Dikas chametz. So those are, I, I think, the main uh, practical differences. In terms of davening, uh, just a, a few things that people ask about a lot. Here it is. I just spoke about how beautiful it is to have hollow Seder night uh, when one is not davening with a minion, not davening in Shul. It would not make sense to say a separate hollow after Marv. We'll say hollow in the, at the Seder, God willing. Um, we don't say the tefillah of Tal if we're davening privately, so we would stop. At the first one I that we would not say Masha Baruch and Mordecai would be Mincha of the first day of Pesach. And um, a very, very important point, one may say Yisker without a minion. So on the last day of Pesach, those who say Yisker should say Yisker at home. Before I go on to some thoughts about Pesach, I want to mention one more thank you. Um, Sammy Franco is ending his term as president uh, very soon. And on behalf of the whole shul, I want to thank him very much for his tremendous devotion. Uh, always, always ready to figure out how to help people. Always ready to come up with a creative solution. Always ready to roll up his sleeves himself. Um, and the fact that in this last years of, of his presidency, he did all of these things while tending to the needs of his uh, beloved, to all of us, very dear father, Mr. Nat Franco, he's a coronal of Racha, and, and, and of course, uh, dealing with his passing and, and dealing with the months of Avelos after his passing to also keep up the communal responsibilities that he holds with such dignity and energy and still have that smile. It's uh, really something we can all learn from. Uh, I'm sure, particularly in these past months, it was very challenging. But Sammy, if you don't mind my saying so, especially now that we don't have Minyanim, it's harder to think of a more beautiful cottage that could be said for Nat Franco than his son being so intimately involved in so many ways with our shul. And of course, your father referred to it as his house. So thank you very much. And may each and every one of your beautiful actions uh, over these years and over these specific months be a tremendous chus for your father's neshama. The Seder this year is going to be so different 
And to be honest with you, I think for many of us, it's going to be difficult to really get excited for the Seder. My guess is that if every person watching this video would just pause for a moment and think about what to them, if they had to boil it down to one thing, what is the most special part of the Seder that is most meaningful for them? Think about it for a second. What would you answer to that question? Um, many people, I'm sure, would answer something having to do with children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Many people would probably say just sitting there and looking out at a table of so many family and friends. Uh, some people might talk about the wonderful food that they have at the Seder, whether it be in their own home, whether it be at relatives, whether it be in a hotel. Uh, some people might talk about this one Dvar Torah that they give or that someone else gives that means so much to them. We'll all come up with different things. My guess is the strongest thing in common is that a very high percentage of the thing that's so special is probably not going to be happening this year at the Seder. So many loved ones, so many friends won't be sitting with us at this Seder. Uh, so many people who love to go to a specific location won't be going there. So how are we supposed to get excited for the Seder? How are we supposed to do this? I want to share with you a very interesting idea from the morale. I've shared this in other contexts in past years, but I think it's specifically appropriate for this here. And there's a very famous question asked about the Seder that when we talk about the matzah, the matzah remarkably is a symbol of two very different things. The matzah is called lechem oni, loosely translated as poor man's bread. The matzah represents our slavery in Egypt. And the matzah also represents our remarkably quick departure once God said it was time for us to go from Egypt. So the matzah is both the symbol of the difficulties of Egypt and it's also the symbol of the Exodus. Why in the world is it both? And maybe better put, how could it be both? How could we call it poor man's bread? And there will be all these halachos that it has to be thought of as poor man's bread. And yet when we eat it at the Seder, we're only, we only fulfill the mitzvah if we, if we lean the way that we're supposed to lean. Because you have to eat it like, uh, like, like royalty. But it's poor man's bread. If you have to eat it like royalty, why are we eating that? So many different answers to this question. The morale explains that the reason why it's called Lechem Oni is it's not as much poor man's bread, it's more simple bread. And that it's just flour and water baked and nothing else. And the Maral says that that simplicity of the matzah needs to be, must be emblematic of the swift departure which the Jews had from Egypt. Why? Maral says, imagine the following, or maybe I'll modernize the muscle a, a drop for a moment. Imagine the following situation. You have a person who, thank God, is affluent. They have a wonderful job. The person lives in a beautiful home, beautiful community, and so on and so forth. And they get a phone call, and they're asked in the phone call, would you consider leaving it all behind and uh, moving to a different place. So uh, nine and a half times out of ten, the affluent person would laugh at the questioner and say, why in the world should I go to that different place? I have everything I need here. Now imagine the situation that a person, heaven forbid, heaven forbid, is living on a park bench, unemployed, doesn't have any family or friends in the area. All the person has is their own self. And someone approaches them and says, what do you think about picking up and moving to a different locale? It's much more likely that that second person would be ready to go. And the morale says, the beauty of the situation when the Jews left Egypt was that they had nothing in their lives other than themselves, each other, and their relationship with God. 
That's what they had. So God comes to them and says he's ready to lead them into the desert, that they're going to become his chosen people. Ultimately, they'll receive the Torah at our Sinai, but the first they're going into the desert. If the Jewish people had all of these things, if the Jewish people had all of these trappings, it would have been much more difficult to leave Egypt. What the Jewish people recognized when they left Egypt was the only thing that mattered in their lives was God. So the simplicity of the Egypt experience when they were in Egypt symbolized their terrible, terrible slavery, but that very simplicity, when it was time to leave, that's what made it possible to go. But to the Jewish people's credit, that wasn't just a momentary thought. The Jewish people continued to internalize that idea that what God provided for them by giving them the opportunity to go out and follow him in the desert was God provided them with tremendous meaning. And therefore, in celebration of the Exodus, the Jewish people eat this simple, simple bread that's just flour and water to symbolize the fact, bare bones, nothing else, nothing else in our lives counts besides our relationship with God. So that which symbolized the slavery symbolizes the exodus and more importantly symbolizes the dynamic and the nature of the relationship with God. What's the Seder really supposed to be about? The Seder is a wonderful time for family to get together, a, a, a special time. It's a wonderful time to sit with friends. It's a wonderful time to eat good food. It's a wonderful time to have nice surroundings. It's a wonderful time to hear a good Tvar Torah. Are any of those things what the Seder is really, really about? Presumably, if we were really, really to drill down, what the Seder is about is Chayav Adam Liros es Atzmo Ki'ilu Huyatam Mitzrayim. As we say in that Gara, a person is obligated to see themselves as if they indeed left Egypt. That's an emotional experience. We're very distracted at our Seders. We're very distracted by our guests. We want to please them, as we should. Sometimes we have certain stresses or frustrations with them, as is the norm. We're very distracted by many, many things. You know what? This year, we're going to have much less distraction. Much less distraction. And I think it's a very powerful thing and I think we very well might be better equipped this year to really stop and take it slow and really allow the thoughts to flow within ourselves. We need to see ourselves as if we left Egypt. What does that mean? So I think one idea of what that means is to just reflect. And this is the most basic idea. God did a kindness to the Jewish nation by taking the Jewish people out of Egypt. We benefit from that today too. Because what did it mean that God took the people out of Egypt? God took the Jewish people out of Egypt. He made them his chosen nation. He gave them his Torah. And we today benefit from the fact that God gave the Jewish people his Torah. And that's one very basic thing to think about. Think about how very different our lives are than those of so many people around us. Think about how we have a concept of faith. Think about how we have an outlook, even in these extremely challenging times, our outlook, our perspective is so much connected to Hashem and His Torah, how fortunate we are. But that's not the only way we can think about Chai Batam Lirosasatsmoki Luyatsam Mitzrayim. 
what if we were to sit, what if we were to reflect on the unique opportunities that we've had in our lives? How many of us can sit and think for a moment, would we be sitting at this Seder tonight had we not met such and such at a certain time? Had we not spent time in, 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 in such a place? Had we not met a certain individual who inspired us? Had we not met a certain person who married us? Had we not had the opportunity to grow up in a certain home? The list goes on and on and on and on and on. So the same way that the Jewish people who actually left Egypt had to sit back and reflect and think to themselves, if had God not taken us out of Egypt, where would we be today? It's true for us too. Where would I be today in so many different ways? As, as, as an individual, not even as part of the Jewish people. Where would I be as an individual in so many different ways today if not by the goodness of God, if not by the kindness of God. One more idea. And Chayvatam Liros Asatzmo, Kilu Yatsim Mitzrayim, it's something I've mentioned in other contexts. Sfas Emes says that the whole door of a door, that's the earlier phrase, in every generation a person is obligated to see him or herself as if they left Egypt. Why did God take the Jewish people out of Egypt? God took the Jewish people out of Egypt because he saw them and he saw them as being an appropriate nation to serve him. God treasured what would happen in the future and the potential that they would perform the beautiful mitzvahs that they would perform. It says the Sfas Emes, in every generation, doesn't matter how much longer after the exodus from Egypt, a person is compelled to sit and think to themselves, when God decided to take the Jews out of Egypt, at, he did it because he saw the potential for them to do mitzvot. He didn't only see the potential for those people to do mitzvot. He thought about me. He thought about my sitting tonight eating matzah at the Seder. He thought about my sharing the story of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim of the exodus with my children. A person needs to see him or herself as being worthy in the eyes of God for the sake of his or her mitzvot to have left Egypt too. And so to reflect on that idea also, how precious my good deeds are in the eyes of God. How powerful my good deeds are in the eyes of God. Each of these three things are things that I think are very meaningful to reflect on at the Seder. And I think it could be said are core to what the Seder is supposed to be. And my friends, this Seder is going to be very difficult for so many of us in so many ways. I, I specifically want to mention the people with the extremely unique challenge of sitting alone at the Seder. And, and it, my heart and so many others' hearts go out to you. But for all of us, Regardless of the difficulty at the Seder, there is an opportunity, there's a great opportunity to really think and really reflect and really emotionally connect. And maybe just maybe more so this year than in other years. But I want to think about one more idea that I think is core to the Seder, and I'm not sure how often we have the opportunity to think about it in a serious way. Pesach is the holiday of Geula, the holiday of redemption. The Jewish people could not begin to fathom when they were slaves in Egypt before Moshe came along. The Jewish people could not begin to fathom what it would mean to leave Egypt, to go into the desert, to accept the Torah at our Sinai, and ultimately for the nation down the road to enter the land of Israel. My friends, we can't begin to fathom what our ultimate redemption will look like. 
But part of the lesson of the Pesach story is great things can happen. Remarkable things can happen. They happened in the Pesach story. They will happen again. The Geula, the ultimate redemption, the Mashiach, the third base of Mikdash, all of it will come. We say it right at the beginning of the Seder, this is the poor man's bread. We spoke about it already. That our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. And later in that paragraph we say, This year we're here, wherever here may be. Next year we should merit to be in the land of Israel. We end off the, the, the Magid section of our Seder or after Magad, excuse me, but before the very end, with singing the song, L'shana Habab Yerushalayim. May it be that God brings us next year to a redeemed Jerusalem. It's part of the Seder. But do we think about it? And I think there are many reasons why it's difficult to think about it at the Seder. I think there are many reasons why it's difficult to think about it year-round. And my theory is, agree or disagree, my theory is that the strongest reason why it's difficult to think about the ultimate redemption is we don't feel we need it that much. We're kind of happy with how things are. Our lives aren't perfect. We have problems. But all in all, things aren't, aren't that bad. And we don't really know what it would be like to all live in Israel with a third base of Mikdash and a Mashiach. Sure, some of it would probably be great. Some of it would probably be a very significant change. We don't look forward to change that much. So I actually think that this year we're in a very, very unique position to maybe just maybe aspire to the ultimate redemption in a little bit more of an emotional way than we normally would. And that is, <laughs> we don't like the current situation. Thank God, it could be a lot worse. But we have so many stresses, real stresses. Who doesn't know someone who's ill? Rahman al Islam, we of course know that mem people that we know have died. Heaven forbid across the country, across the world, across the Jewish community. People have died. This is so frightening. The isolation is so difficult. The worries about the economy are, are significant. There's a lot of problems in our current situation, and we turn to God and we implore God to help us. But maybe, just maybe, we can wrap our minds around something, somewhere, at some point, being better than the status quo. Not just as an abstract idea, I'm sure it's better than the status quo. No, we know the status quo could be better. But it could be much better. It could be so much better. It could be better than we ever imagined it could be. And I want to give you a very simple muscle for just a moment. Imagine, I have, with God's help, we should get out of this challenging state in which we find ourselves very soon. But just imagine, theoretically speaking, that there was a person who, for whatever reason, only knew what life was like during the coronavirus. An adult, a mature person, they only knew what life was like during the coronavirus. And let's say you were having a conversation with this person while it was still during the coronavirus. And you said to them, you know, I, I'm, I really can't wait for this all to end and to get back to normal life. The person shrugs their shoulders and says, no, nah, I think it's fine how it is. You look at the person, you think it's fine how it is? Do you not enjoy the rest of, me, of humanity? And the person says to you, what do you mean do I not enjoy the rest of humanity? I have Zoom meetings. I see people. I pick up a phone every now and then. I talk to people. 
and you say to the person, okay, okay, uh, let's try a different tag. Let's, let's try something else. Have you ever been to a restaurant? Uh, you ever like the idea of going out with a friend, family for a nice meal? With all this business, you can't do that. The person says, of course I can do that. I, they deliver. I can I can pick up. Of course, as an aside, it's it's to the extent that it's feasible for us, it's it's a great thing to do to help support our, our Jewish restaurants and food establishments at this time. Just please to keep in mind. But he says to you, "What do you mean restaurants? I have restaurants. I have establishments. They they drop off the food. I pick it up. What's the big deal?" And you would sit there and say, wow, this guy's giving decent answers, but he really doesn't get it. Doesn't he understand that to sit with another human being, to actually touch their hand, to actually give them a hug, to sit around a table with other people is worlds apart from a Zoom meeting? Doesn't a person understand that to sit in a nice restaurant, just of one of many examples, to sit in a nice restaurant with appropriate lighting and nice music in the background and and, 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 and and appropriate decor is different than getting your your supper in a plastic bag, no matter how delicious the food might taste. So now I want to go to something else. Do we dream for the ultimate redemption? The vast majority of us don't dream for the ultimate redemption. Why not? Don't we want to live lives of spirituality? You know what the answer is? Sure, I want to live a life of spirituality. I can go to shul. I have spirituality. You can go to shul. The base Hamikdash, the temple, the place where all of Cloud Israel would come. Pesach, Pesach time. The courtyard of the base Hamikdash would be full with people bringing the Korban Pesach. You could feel the presence of God in the temple. You think it's the same thing as Shul? If we think it's the same thing as Shul, we're just like that person who says he's not isolated. He has Zoom meetings. Wouldn't it be wonderful? to have the ultimate redemption and be united with our people in Israel. Nah! I'm united as is. I have unity as is. How do you have unity as is? Well, you know, every now and then there's some big Jewish cause and uh, all the different organizations sign up for it. So I feel united. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. I want to share with you an Alshech. The Alshech says... Says in the Pasuk, the Shechno Sidrashu Uvasa Shama, that we should seek out the divine presence of God and we should come there. This is referring to the spot of the base of Mikdash, the temple. Why does it say we should come to the temple? It should say we should go to the temple. The Halachta Shama. Why does it say Uvasa Shama? So the Al Shech says that the Pshat is that the base of Mikdash, the temple, is a composite of each and every one of us has a special capacity to forge a connection between our soul and the sanctity of the base of Mikdash. But the way my soul connects to the base of Mikdash is slightly different than the way your soul connects to the base of Mikdash. But the base of Mikdash is a place for true unity. The base of Mikdash, the temple, is a place that I fully find myself, that I fully connect to my relationship with God while concurrently connecting to everyone else among the Jewish people. That, my friends, is real unity. So as we sit at this strange, bizarre Seder, some of us very difficultly being alone. So many of us not being with the people that we want to be with, not being with all the people that we want to be with. 
so many of us scrambling to figure out our first Pesach that we're making in years, so many of us the first time we're making Pesach, so many challenges, so many things to miss. But I would humbly posit to you that the fact that it'll probably be simpler than what we're used to, simpler in who's around the table and maybe even simpler in presentation, is a remarkable opportunity to take that morale's idea of the Lechem Oni, that the reason why the matzah symbolizes the exodus from Egypt is because the matzah is simple. And the core of the exodus of Egypt is, God, my life is not complicated. My life is about my relationship with you. To think that way at the Seder, this is what my life is about. My life is about being part of the Jewish people, though I'm isolated at the time. My life is about God and His Torah. My life is about connecting to God and how very, very fortunate I am to have that connection. And I have that connection because the Jewish people left Egypt. And to dream. Whether it be at the Seder, we should start that at the Seder. It's a three-day umtiv. There's plenty of time to think. No one to schmooze with that Kiddush. To dream that maybe, just maybe, in the merit of our tefillos, in the merit of our mitzvos, in the merit of our looking out for each other, in the merit of our wanting it, that the ultimate redemption will come. Thank you for taking the time to allow me to share my thoughts with you. I want to wish everyone a Chag Kasher V'Sameach. And with God's help, we should be reunited soon. It would be wonderful to be reunited back at Shoal really soon. It would be even more special for all of the Jewish people to be reunited in Yerushalayim. Bim Heirav Yameinu. Take good care. And may everyone have a wonderfully inspiring and somehow some way joyful Yom Tov.